Right, I've got the weathers and the max. Rain hats. Times two. Waterproof trousers, dry socks. Double check. Which just leaves the rug and the picnic basket. Yup, packed and ready to go. Perfect. We're all set for another British summer. Hello again and welcome to Summer with Richard and Judy. Coming up this time... It takes the beach in one breathtaking gulp, palm trees dominoing down and fishing boats scattering as easily as the seeds of a dandelion. In the non-fiction books, whoever it is writing says, you know, she did this, this and this. Yeah. A fiction writer tries to convey what it was like. It was my mother who had found me, of course. She had heard both explosions from the kitchen, separated by at least a minute of quiet. Ahoy there, downloaders, and uh, thanks for joining us on the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. So, let's get cracking. Tigers in Red Weather by Liza Klausman. I could hear the hush of the night around me as I made my way down North Water Street toward Tiger House. The sidewalks were empty, and I was greeted only with the sound of my own shoes hitting In this the first show of the Summer 2013 series, we're joined by the great-great-great-granddaughter of Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. She's called Liza Klausman, and she's here to talk about her book, Tigers in Red Weather. Do you think, and I mean this as a compliment to Liza, as you were reading it, that times that you were getting echoes of The Great Gatsby, you know, Scott Fitzgerald? No, I thought it had echoes, because at the time it's set, um, it's, well, obviously it's much later, because it starts in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. But there is that kind of echo of, uh, of Gatsby and this gilded, wonderful life uh, mm. they, the family shares on Martha's Vineyard, which is, of course, we all know, a haven for the rich and famous. In uh, the summer. In the it has summer. to be in the summer. In the yeah. summer. And they, ha they spend their summers there, um, Nick and Helena, the, their cousins, and their grandparents uh, had owned a beautiful, beautiful house on Martha's Vineyard. The whole extended family goes there every summer and they don't do anything but drink and have parties and play jazz records. So there's that, that sort of party, frivolous element, which is very much reminiscent of The Great Gatsby. But also, and this is true of a lot of Fitzgerald's work, uh, also the dark side to great wealth, that you know, all of us who, who aspire to great wealth, everybody wants to be rich, do we really? Because with massive yes, we wealth, do. the kind, <laughs> yeah, we do. The, the, the kind, no, but the, the, the kind that's been written about here. Well, with, with that can come terrible darkness and danger and, Almost punishment. Well, I think. I mean, I think what she's, what Liza Klausman's trying to do is to show that, despite all this gilded beauty and this luxurious life there, and oh my God, you can feel the heat in uh, Tigers in Red Weather. You can really feel it all the yes, time. You said you at know. one time you felt like going having a cooling, cooling shower. Cooling shower, you know, because it, it, it's beautifully written. It's incredibly evocative. So Liza, Liza Klausman, Tigers in Red Weather. I have to say that it was probably my favourite of the entire list. Um, I absolutely. Loved it. And astonishingly, again, it's your first novel. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for those very kind words. Yes, it is my first book. Um, I started that book when I was doing my master's degree here in London um, at Royal Holloway and um, finished it about three years later. Yeah. So it's been a wild ride, I have to say. But yes. It reads, it's such an accomplished piece of work. I mean, most debut novels look like that. You know, they're a bit lumpy for all the editing process. You know, they're, they're a bit sharp at the edges, but it's so smoothly written. It's fabulous. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think partially, I mean, for me, I think the structure, which is slightly complicated, was hmm. sort of an easy way to contain the material while I was working on it. Yes, it's kind of told from five different characters' points of view as, exactly. as you go through. And, uh, and yeah, because it spans a lot of years. Um, yeah. And as these characters who start... Nick and Nick is a, is a girl. Um, uh, took me a sentence or two to realise <laughs> that. But Nick is a girl and her cousin Helena um, are young wartime... Well, Nick is a wartime bride because it starts in 1945. Yeah. And Helena is a wartime widow, very young widow. And it starts at the end of the war. They're in Boston and they're, she, Nick is waiting for her husband Hughes to come home. Um, Helena is about to go off to Hollywood to marry this distinctly dubious character, <laughs> Avery, which made us laugh because we were once shown around. Um, we were making a, a program in, um, in California called, um, well, it was our program, but it was in Disneyland. What are you saying? 
It was in Disneyland. Listen, yes. this is interesting. And the guy who was showing us around, who was the most useless, pathetic person who was supposed to get us into all these amazing places, was called Avery. Mm. And I ended up calling him Avery Birdseed because that was about what <laughs> It is it a weird, called... shady name for some reason. I agree. Avery, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it starts off with these girls on the threshold of the rest of their lives. And co the thing that unites them, apart from being cousins, is this wonderful house on Martha's Vineyard called... Tiger House. Right. Now tell us about Tiger House. Um, well, Tiger House is a sort of um, um, con conglomerate house in the sense that I had, my family has had several houses on the vineyard over several generations. Um, hmm. And so I used pictures from one of the houses, which was actually destroyed by a hurricane, um, to, that I modeled it, let's say, after, after that original house, which was my great great grandmother's house. Um, which was a huge, sprawling house in, you know, sort of pole position yeah. on the harbor. Um, and, you know, I did some tweaks, obviously, to sort of um, to, to sort of geographically position it exactly where I wanted it to be. But it is modeled after that. So my house, which my brother and I own now in the vineyard, is a oh. much smaller, dingier affair. <laughs> <laughs> but one can dream. Yeah. Mm. The thing that struck me about the book was how you can see the influence of an author you admire greatly, Scott Fitzgerald, in, in, in the writing and in, in the story. And it's very much about um, this group of fabulously wealthy people. I mean, what was it Fitzgerald said? The, the rich are different from us, mm. they have more money or something, something yeah. like that. Um, were you drawn to that, that, that magic almost of extreme wealth? Um, yeah, I think, I guess that's a hard question. I mean, I think that I, 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 I think that it always presents an interesting thing to dig into because you have something that should be idyllic on the surface. Mm. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to flip on its head. And I mean, some people may think, well, you know, what could their problems truly be? And indeed, maybe they are smaller than having to sort oh, of no, scrabble I mean, for your living. But well, look, at the um, look at the Kennedys. Yeah, you know, I mean, well, exactly. So, yeah. um, so I think that that was a sort of one of the starting points for me to place it in that class. Mm. Um, yeah. And also, I grew up in this sort of East Coast wasp society, so yeah. Yeah. clearly not in the same kind of money category as the Derringers are, but, um, you yeah, know, but I knew a lot of people like that. Were so. you, were you yeah. kind of seduced by it, though, in the way that Fitzgerald was? I mean, Fitzgerald was definitely seduced I by these... I don't think the rich are different things. than you and I, now. <laughs> 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 I think it's Hemingway's Repos that says, yeah, they're different and they have money. Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is probably more closer to the truth. But yeah. I do think that it just sets up a good plot device on a certain level. It's an excellent plot, plot device, and what you get is this, um, as the years go by, you see Nick and you see Helena and you see Helena's marriage to this ghastly, failed or uh, aspiring but failed Hollywood mogul. Mm. Um, and you see uh, Nick and Hughes um, are sort of happy most of the time, not all of the time. But Nick is the central character, isn't she? Yeah. She is. She she is the memoir, and she's a she she's an enigma because she in some ways she's hard to like, but she's absolutely fascinating. She's got this special aura about her that everyone is drawn to her. Everyone does what she wants to do. Uh, she what to you? Although all five of the main characters yeah. are very interesting, she was the main one to you. Yeah, I mean, she was sort of my anti-heroine. Um, and she's based um, partially, uh, well, sort of a blueprint, let's say, the beginning of her was based on my grandmother, who was a really complicated person, um, who had this sort of, you know, side that she could be wonderful, she could be really cruel. Um, and it made me, it, she died right before I started writing the book. Gosh. And I was very close with her. And um, it made me just think about what makes a person that way. You know, how yeah. do you sort of unravel, as you say, the enigma. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I tried to write someone from their earlier life to kind of put them through their paces to see how they yeah. would turn out that way. And what about all this period detail? Because as Julie said, it spans a long period of time, you know, the 1940s, 50s, into the 60s. Um, and it's very uh, compelling, the, the, the period background that you draw. Did that, was that sort of online computer research? Or, I mean, there or was what? definitely research, but as I said, I was close to my grandparents and I grew up with them in their house for okay. a part of my childhood. So I sort of lived with people of that same generation. So, in a weird way, I don't know if you have this, but your grandparents' houses never seem to change. Absolutely. They have yes. the same weird old stuff in there from when they used to use it and they kind of tell yeah. you what it is. So I knew some things. And then, of course, there's research that you have to do. But there's a lot of alcohol in it. I mean, the, the, the summers that they spend together as, a, as a, an extended family um, on Martha's Vineyard, um, that they're always having cocktails, yeah. uh, having gin, martinis, uh, and, and everything kind of seems to... And I, I, I love that. Yeah. Gin, it, now, really? it, <laughs> I love that because it, it's very, as you say, it's very Great Gatsby-ish. It's very kind of redolent of how wonderful and idyllic these summers were. Yeah. And then gradually, gradually darkness is introduced into their lives. Uh, Nick um, gets darker and 
crucially, they have children, yeah. Ed and Daisy. Now, Ed's father is Avery. Avery is very peculiar, sexily, yeah. and Ed kind of gets that from him. And as a teenager, he really is the major dark force on the island. Um, although I thought you let him off a bit lightly. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Do, do you think? Oh no, I can't ask you that because it will. Um, give it away. I give it away. No, I can't ask, ask you that. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, but th there is that that sort of also that feeling of inevitable sense that something terrible is going to happen as you, as you go through these golden summers. You you sense it. Did you? Uh, were you also influenced perhaps by Secret History by Donna Tartt? I, I, you know, I haven't. Just shame to say that I have not read the Secret History. Um, it, but I was influenced a lot by noir. I have to say, I yeah. did, and I'm sure the Secret History has some of that oh, thread. Oh, it's fantastic! Yeah. Um, I th I think I read the little the little friend is the one. Oh I yes, read. I read the second one. So, too, yeah. um, but um, were you influenced by the Kennedys at all? By by the, the fact that they had this extraordinarily glamorous lifestyle, which which in fact led them to terribly chappaquiddick, you know. No, sort of I was. I mean, they definitely play a huge role in the island because mm. of all of the things that happened there. You know, mm. the chappaquiddick yeah, incident. Yeah, they had yeah, houses yeah. that you yeah. know, and, and what was it, John John, who crashed his plane on the flight over there. And yeah. So they they definitely have this kind of imprint on the island. But I, my family were um, Republicans, oh, right. so um, yeah. they, you know, the Kennedys were just <laughs> below the beneath the salt, you know. Uh, <laughs> Rough Irish um, There's actually a part in the book where I think, you know, Helena says, oh, you know, who has that accent, really? Yeah. And that's a direct <laughs> right, yeah. quote from one, my grandmother who just, you know, despised yeah. them. Oh. Oh. What about the power of your writing? I mean, um, it's a debut novel. It's, as we said, it's, it's quite extraordinary. What about um, the writing courses, which are such an established thing now in America? Mm. So many people like you um, have, have, have the experience of being on a creative writing course. And over here now. And well. over, increasingly over here. But there has been some snobbery about them until recently here. Um, they're a very important part of the scene, of the literary scene over in the States, aren't they? Yes. I mean, I think that, you know, we don't have the same kind of snobbery that they were met with here because they've been around longer. Mm. And Americans also, I think, have a very different view on kind of talent. Yes, the things do. can be taught, um, and they don't sort of take the view they that think, maybe I, it can't. Yeah. Mm. Um, but do, in that, hang on, do, do you think there is such a thing though as a born writer, someone who simply has the gene that can do it? I mean, I think some people are probably have more facility with language than other people do um, when it comes to putting it on paper. Mm. But um, that's not always the only thing that drives a book. You know, I mean, mm. it could be the way that your mind works in terms of storytelling. It could be, you know, sort of various things. So I don't think um, that is necessarily... It's mm. a good point. I can think, I wouldn't name them because it would be rude, but I can think of two British writers who have great success, who frankly aren't very good writers, but they can tell a damn good story. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's a lot of different ways to be a writer, if you, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, I don't know. I mean, is that innate? It's, it can be worked on, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing that makes a writer is, I mean, this is such a cliche, but you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> if you finish a book, you're a writer. You may be a bad writer, but you're a writer nonetheless, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's the thing that every writer has in common is they went ahead and finished something. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's great there's that attitude in America and that, you know, it's much healthier than ours, which is that, you know, you're either up there or you're down there. And then when you are up there, you put back down there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. But still, listen, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I mean, a real accomplishment. I, I, Thank I, you I so much. Tell so you we tell much. you that, that uh, lots of our friends and colleagues who kind of work within the book club, when, when we were going through our long list to select the short list of which this is now a part of, were ringing us up and saying, have you read Tigers and Red, oh, Red Weather? Yeah. Have you read it? it? You've got to, you, you must pick it or we'll kill you. you know, oh, it's, well, that it's, warms the cockles. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a terrific book. Well, yeah. I'm very envious of you and your life on Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> and your grandparents from Martha's Vineyard. She lives in a shack, too. She's surrounded by the decades yeah. of her grandmother's rubbish. <laughs> Peeling paint and, you know, <laughs> mortgages. And, you know, don't be, don't be obvious. Well, you've done Martha's Vineyard proud. Oh, thank, thank you very you much, very indeed. Much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Huge Great pleasure. pleasure. My name is Liza Klausman, and I have written Tigers in Red Weather. Okay, if I was to sum up my book in one word, um, I guess I would choose Dangerous. I could hear the hush of the night around me as I made my way down North Water Street toward Tiger House. The sidewalks were empty, and I was greeted only with the sound of my own shoes hitting the pavement. My novel is written from the perspective of five different people, um, and the reason for that was, um, for me, the sort of structure mirrors, um, in a way, the way a family works, um, in that there's no sort of one objective truth. And rather, we have all these different varying subjective truths, and sometimes they even contradict each other. And so it's sort of wedging them together to approximate the whole picture. I was thinking that the evening had been a good one. Then I saw them. The dim porch light scattered shadows around them and gave Daisy's hair a glow like bright fire. They were standing so close together, yet their bodies weren't quite touching. 
I didn't find um, writing the book that way that difficult. Um, in fact, I think it helped me sort of control the material in the sense that I could um, sort of write one thing and be done with it and move on to something else rather than stringing so many threads through, which I think you do have to do um, in a continuous narrative. Gray, dusty-winged night moths were skittering overhead, and I had the fanciful notion that they were attracted by the glow coming off Daisy rather than the light above. His hand was in her hair, pulling her head back slightly. She was on the brink, not entirely in control, and it was as if what had begun earlier in the evening on that same porch was about to be completed, like a full bloom. And then he kissed her, and I knew there was going to be trouble. It was, a, it was a strange thing to have the book go out into the world, I think. The finishing, I think it was Truman Capote who said that finishing a novel is um, like taking a child out in the backyard and shooting it in the head, um, which is, of course, very dramatic, uh, just like Capote. But um, there is a sense of loss, but I think that you lose the book more once it gets published rather than in the finishing of it because it become, starts to belong to all these other people. And it's tremendously exciting to see my book on the bookshelves. Um, it's also nerve-wracking. Um, and when people don't like it or when you see comments or reviews that aren't positive, of course, it hurts your feelings. But um, it's, you know, that's, I think, the risk-taking. I think you have to have a risk-taking nature to write books. Um, but, yeah, I mean, when I first saw my book in hardcover, it was, like, amazing. I never thought it would get there. I guess my advice is to, um, you know, don't, don't lose confidence in yourself. Don't lose your nerve because that's what gets you through in the end. Um, it's terrifying and exhilarating, you know, um, but that, that is what you want. I mean, I think the first time I saw a stranger reading my book was the best day um, since I knew that the book was going to be published. Um, and it's very exciting. You kind of want to run up to them and grab them and be like, do you love it? Um, <laughs> but you must restrain yourself. Tell us about your great reads and join the debate on Facebook forward slash Richard and Judy Book Club. We do love hearing from you, of course. Did you like the book? Do you have a reading guilty pleasure? What other titles do you think we should be reviewing? Well, do get in touch and find some more great books on our website. That's whsmith.co.uk forward slash Richard and Judy. A book I've read recently, which I really have enjoyed, A Gathering Light. Uh, which was our book club book last time, which was just fantastic. It's a, a real-life murder story, which is told in a very interesting way. So I thoroughly recommend it. I have just finished reading Bertie Plays the Blues by Alexander McCall Smith, which is from a series of books called 44 Scotland Street. They're set in Edinburgh and they feature several different families um, because he originally created them as a series of small novels for the Scotsman newspaper. They are absolutely brilliantly funny, um, amusing, his typical kind of gentle humour, but real laugh out loud places as well. Highly recommended. From the Richard and Judy Book Club, I'm looking forward to reading Adriana Trigiani's the Shoemaker's Wife, um, because I so enjoyed Rococo with its, its hint of Mediterranean sunshine that I'm really looking forward to the next book from her. I'm not going out in that. Oh, come on, I've made a great spread. Let's stay home and have a carpet picnic. Brilliant. You get the jam jars uh, and I'll bring in a little bit of summer to us. I just have to press... Play and a presto. Which reminds me, follow us on Twitter at WHSmithCoUK. Next time. If I had to describe my book in one or two words, I think I would say, what if? Richard and Judy will be meeting Karen Thompson-Walker and reviewing her book, The Age of Miracles.